Our first reading this morning comes from John chapter 14, verses 11 through 24. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, as, and he will give you another advocate, to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them, and we will make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Since... Valentine's Day is coming up. I thought I might start with a uh, cheery little statistic. According to recent government studies, a full 30% of women who are murdered, it happens because they're murdered by their husbands. And that doesn't include the ones that are murdered by a boyfriend or some other significant other. Only 9% when it comes down to it of women who are murdered were murdered by a stranger. That means that most often the person who did it was someone who was supposed to love them. You know, sometimes we get some pretty twisted ideas about what love is. Why is it that it is so easy for us to hurt the ones that we're supposed to love the most? I mean, put murder aside for a moment. I mean, I know that's kind of a way, that's a shocking way to kind of get you into the sermon this morning, but, but think just about in our daily lives, just in our uh, everyday dealings, it's those people who live in our household, who we are in contact with the most, are the ones that it's easiest to hurt. And I guess that makes a certain amount of sense because of their proximity, but also because just the nature of the relationship of love whether we're talking about a spouse, a family member, a fellow church member, someone we see at work, those people that we're supposed to love and care about, uh, the, the nature of those relationships implies a level of vulnerability, and it, and it opens us up to the possibility of wounding. And yet, sometimes we think those are the safest places. Well, you know, they're still going to be there, and they're still going to put up with me even if I'm difficult, right? And yet, sometimes that's not the case. I've often heard it said that the devil and his allies love to take the skin of the truth and stuff it with a lie. Or one of the ways I put it personally is that evil sometimes all is necessary is to take something good and godly and twist it just a little bit, just enough to turn it against its original purpose while still maintaining the appearance of goodness. We get tricked sometimes into thinking that loving someone means you're always supposed to feel good in that relationship. And when the good feelings aren't there, whether again, whether we're talking about a spouse, a romantic relationship, whether we're talking about uh, someone in our family or uh, someone we work with or someone that we go to church with, we start confusing love with good feelings, or we start confusing loving someone with owning them, that they'll just do what we want them to do because we, we just love them that much. Or that if you love someone 
They just have to love you back, right? And then we do all sorts of crazy things to support these misguided hypotheses. But as I'm sure you are aware, there is something more to the character of love in terms of the love that God intended for us. So I'm going to read to you what I believe is the best definition of love that was ever written. And that is because it was inspired by God. And the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and it was kind of a follow-up on one of our readings from last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. And Paul writes, and God says to us, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all my possessions and hand my body over so that I may boast, but do not have love, I'm nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they'll come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end, for we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I only know in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You know, I probably could read that one uh, without actually looking at the page, most of it, because it get, gets read so often, usually in the context of a wedding. Now, I could also probably recite much of the King James Version to you as well, uh, because I had to memorize that when I was in middle school. My Sunday school teacher really loved the King James Version, and so I had to learn what the word vaunteth means, V-A-U-N-T-E-T-H, um, uh, <laughs> means puffs up or something like that, love vaunteth not itself. Um, I had to, but that wouldn't be very helpful for us in this day and age, I don't think, to hear that read uh, in that very formal language. Uh, but, uh, but we also read this passage, as I've said, you know, a lot at weddings. Um, and it's right. It, it's a good thing um, that we read it to a couple who's getting ready to launch off on this new journey, a new way of life that they've never had to do before. Um, because they have to understand certain things about the character of love and things that are going to carry them through the most difficult days uh, that are ahead. And in any marriage, there are difficult days. If it lasts long enough, you get past the honeymoon. Sometimes even on the honeymoon, there's trouble. <laughs> but you see, love, one of the things we sort of trick ourselves into thinking is that it's about feelings, but I also want you to recognize that this reading that we read, if we think, if we restrict it only to weddings, it's kind of a limited application of this scripture because this follows Paul's instructions from the previous chapter that we read last week that's about the interdependence of the body. Remember we said one of the greatest gifts in my message from last week, one of the greatest gifts is the fact that we need each other. That's a good gift. And so Paul is talking about, you know, each of us as individual members of the body of Christ being kind of like individual members of our body, that there's individual parts here, but they're all connected to each other. And when one hurts, the whole body hurts, right? And then Paul ends that as we ended it last week. He says, now I will show you a still more excellent way. And it is from there that he begins to launch into this definition of love. That definition of love is that most excellent way. And it applies not only to 
when a man and a woman love each other and get married, it applies to the greater body of believers as well. And it's not, as you can tell from listening to it, about feelings. In fact, if you read that passage for all it's worth, you discover that it's about a choice we make that governs our actions, sometimes in spite of the feelings. So the first thing that I want to say to you this morning is that love is not about feelings. You know, couples getting married need to know this, but so do followers of Jesus. United in the local and the global body of Christ, the church. Couples need to know it because, you know, that passion that we have when we first start dating and that causes us to say yes when one proposes to the other and causes the other one to do the proposing. Those feelings sometimes change. I know that didn't happen with any of y'all, but sometimes those feelings change. Uh, Sometimes the passionate feelings of, of infatuation that we have for one another turn into feelings of anger or frustration or sadness, or betrayal. And if it was that good when it was good, it's that bad when it was that bad. But you know, sometimes just the feelings ebb low. And we just don't feel it anymore. Sometimes we get locked into routines and our life becomes dry and humdrum and we forget how to kind of light that spark again. And yet... We're called to continue choosing to love one another. But that doesn't just apply to those feelings of romantic love. That also applies to us in the body of Christ. Here's what Paul says in in another one of his letters to the church, the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He says, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you, hear the intensity of that, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, you hear that phrase, bearing with one another? That kind of tells us that Paul is acknowledging that united in the body of Christ, I don't know about you, but when I first really just lit on fire for the church, man, I just... I couldn't be around enough church people. And I just, I didn't care what they did or who they were, where they came from. I just loved on all of them. And maybe you've been there too. You just absolutely get passionately on fire. But, but then kind of like those other relationships, the fire kind of burns low after a while. <laughs> and sometimes people frustrate you. And, and sometimes you're just going through the motions. And sometimes you wake up in a grumpy mood. And yet we're called to continue to love and to bear with one another. So even when people are difficult with us, we are called to bear with them. It necessarily means that it doesn't always feel good in those relationships. Same is true of the family. I mean, it's a good thing that kids are cute, right? (laughs) That's how they manage to survive to adulthood, most of them. Um, But, uh, I mean, you look at those gorgeous little eyes, that beautiful face looking up at you with that kind of, Mommy? Daddy? <laughs> and, and, you know, you kind of ignore everything else that's on the child from what they've just gotten into, right? Uh, because, because they're, you know, God's wired us to, to like those little faces. Uh, but that being said, sometimes it hurts in those relationships. Sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes the people we love disappoint us. Sometimes they betray us. Sometimes they even attack us outright and directly. And yet we're not called just to check out on them. I mean, yes, sometimes we're called to stop enabling unhealthy behavior, but we're never called to just outright abandon someone to check out on them or to hurt them back, even though that's what our heart might be telling us to do. And let me say just a word or two about the heart and and, uh, echo God's words through the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 19 or 9 and 10. He says, get this, the heart is devious above all else. Think about that for a moment. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and searches the heart to give to all according to their ways and according to the fruit of their doings. The heart is deceitful about all else and perverse. You know, one of the things the culture is constantly telling us in popular media and in works of literature and so forth is follow your heart. 
Go wherever it leads you. And that sounds really good. I mean, and there's, there's some truth to that. But the thing, the problem is, sometimes that heart gets us in trouble. Because we're sinners. We're sinners who need a heart transplant. And so some of those sinful hearts are going to lead us astray. We need, a, we need a, a spiritual heart transplant. When our hearts are changed, when they're bent towards God and neighbor by the grace of Jesus Christ, we may still struggle with sinful behaviors, but once we are counted holy, righteous, and redeemed by the grace of Jesus Christ, our hearts can be bent in a new direction, guided by the Holy Spirit-filled illumination of God's Word and the accountable discipleship of the body of Jesus Christ. See, we also can't walk this journey alone. We, we're not called to love on God or love on neighbor by ourselves, but we love on one another. We love God within the body of Christ. And so second, I want to say to you, love is not about you. I mean, it includes you, <laughs> but it is not first and foremost only about you. I mean, first of all, we're not solitary in our relationship with God. It's not just me and God and nobody else, you know? It's, it's me and God and the people that he's called me to be in community with. And this community is not primarily for our own benefit. In terms of leadership, uh, one of the things I want to show you that's going to kind of illustrate this, and Schaefer's going to switch us over to that video and start playing it for us in just a moment, I want to share with you something that comes from the Global Leadership Summit material. Now, bear with me if you're in the uh, Seeker Sunday School class, if you've already seen this video. Uh, but I like watching it. I mean, it reminds me of some very important truths and some things that I have to remember as I attempt to lead people. And, and I hope you find this video to be inspiring and helpful and illustrative of this point that it's not just about you. That's a hard lesson for a lot of us in leadership to really own. Um, I know that always challenges me when I uh, hear words like that in my leadership responsibilities because I can always think of a list of folks that I really need to get around to appreciating. So let me just say right now, <laughs> I notice and you matter <laughs> uh, and I do appreciate you and I'm not just saying that because of what we just heard. Um, there's there's no church without the people who worship in the church, but a church can get by without a pastor. Um, and beyond that, God created you, and I'm an admirer of his work. John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus says, No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus said that, and then he modeled it. He gave himself up. He went to the cross. Jesus did not get onto the cross because it was going to feel good for him. It was anything but that. That is perhaps the most brutal form of torture and, and execution that has ever been devised by human beings. And he willingly went to the cross. He didn't have to except for your sake and mine. So Jesus didn't just talk about sacrificial leadership, he also modeled it. And so third and finally, what I'd like to say to you this morning is that love causes action. Love leads to action. Love governs our actions. If I proclaim love for someone and then just sort of leave it as an intellectual assertion and it never guides my actions, those words are going to ring hollow. I mean... Of course, the First Corinthians reading that we just heard a moment ago kind of points out that the opposite, the other side of that coin is also true, which is that loving or that actions without actual love also lose their meaning. He says they're nothing. Even if you give up your body, he says. Some translations say, give up your body to be burned or give up your body to the flames. That action is absolutely meaningless if it's separated from love. So love without actions is meaningless and actions without love are meaningless, but when you put the two of them together and when your actions are motivated by love, it absolutely transforms the world. You know, 
This is kind of touches with the newsletter article that I uh, shared with you all this week. If you're on the newsletter, newsletter email list, uh, you, you may have read my article by now that, that kind of connects with this, that verse from John 14, 15, where Jesus says, if you'll love me, you'll keep my commandments, all right? If you'll love me, you'll keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Um, and that, that kind of that kind of, since we were talking about love for Valentine's Day and so forth, it, you know, I, th- I thought, well, you know, hey, why don't you try that out on your significant other? Your, why don't you try that out on your, your sweetheart? Happy Valentine's Day. If you love me, you'll do what I tell you to. <laughs> uh, now, Jesus gets to say that for a couple of reasons, whereas I can't say that or better not say that to Jana, right? Um, and, and I hope she wouldn't say that to me. Uh, but, uh, but Jesus can say that, number one, because, I mean, he's God in the flesh, right? I mean, he's the creator of the universe who has come to earth, and, and he's come, why? To save us, right? So, I mean, it's just strictly obedience that says to us that we've got to do what he's telling us to do. That's the obedient route, and it's good for that reason alone, because he's in a position as God himself to tell us what to do. But you know, Jesus doesn't make us do it. He allows us to choose. You see, here's why Jesus saying, if you love me, you'll do what I tell you to, is different beyond just the simple level of obedience. Because Jesus was motivated by love. I mean, John 3.16 says what? It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. And the Son did not come into the world to condemn the world, verse 17, but instead that the world through him might be saved. These are the actions of someone who loves us, who offers himself up. So therefore, Jesus' love and his his admonition to do what he commands us isn't simply a matter of obedience. On a deeper level, he's welcomed us to the family of God because we've been counted positionally righteous. We get to come to his table and sit there with him and partake from the food that he gives us because we've been welcomed to the family. And what that means is that we've been welcomed into the family business because he no longer calls us servants as we find in John chapter 15, but friends because we know now the master's business. We get what he's trying to do. So here's the main point for this morning. Love is a decision we make to seek the best for someone else. So when we love others for our own benefit, and I put love in quotation marks there, if we love others for our own benefit, then it's taking something that God has given us and twisting it, like I was talking about earlier, twisting it just enough to get it out of its purpose and bending it toward evil purposes instead. We've got to love for a different motivation So here's your take-home question for consideration for this morning. What's a loving choice that you can make even if you don't feel like it? What's a loving choice that you can make even when you don't feel like it? Now, just a couple sentences ago, I said we have to love for a different motivation. And so I want to say one final note that kind of got added into the sermon late last night (laughs) and early this morning. Last night, uh, Jana and uh, two of the kids and I went to a rock concert. It was a Christian rock concert uh, over at the HEB Center. We went to go see the Hits Deep uh, tour um, with Toby Mac and some other artists. And Jordan Felice was one of those artists. And he has this song called Beloved. And as I was listening and really paying attention to the words that that song was saying, I began to recognize that the message that I had prepared for this morning was incomplete. There was a very important missing piece to this. And it's the foundation upon which all the other things stand. You know, I've, I've shared with you, you know, three points about what I think you need to do when it comes to love. But there's something we need to know first. Loving others has to grow out of the knowledge, out of the certainty, out of the faith that you are loved. And you are so loved, unconditionally, sacrificially, completely by God. I've hinted around it at other places, but I haven't come out and said it. God loves you sacrificially, unconditionally, and completely, no matter what. (coughs) Excuse me. You may feel 
unloved. You may feel like you're alone. You may feel abandoned, rejected, like you've been discarded or thrown away. You might think that you're too damaged to be used by God or to be loved by Him. You may feel like you're used up. There's nothing left for God to love. That you're so broken that God could never use a broken vessel like you or like you've sinned too much or too deeply. Whatever it is that's popped into your head to make you think that God could not possibly love you, know that He does. He knows it completely and He has chosen to love you in spite of that. Sometimes He uses you because of what you've been through. Whatever it is that keeps you from feeling like God can't use you and God doesn't love you, He knows it and He loves you completely. If God could love Rahab the prostitute who through her submission to God became a part of God's plan for redemption and one of the ancestors of Jesus, then God loves, then know that God loves and can use you. (coughs) If God could love Peter, the impulsive, panicky disciple who abandoned and denied Jesus when things got bad, then know that He loves and can use you to transform the world. If God could love someone like Paul, who made it his job as Saul of Tarsus to go around persecuting and murdering Jesus' followers, then know that God loves and can use you to build his church. If God could love a brutal slave trader like John Newton, to turn away from his wickedness and who then turned his life over to God and wrote to him amazing grace and died virtually penniless because he'd given all, all he had away for the cause of God's kingdom, then know that God loves and can use you. If God could love Richard Nixon's hatchet man, Chuck Colson, once he had repented of his sin, to reach people around the world languishing in prison with the gospel message, then know that God can love and use you to proclaim release to the captives. Speaking of prison, if God could love a man like Joe Moreno, a murderer who I met in Kairos prison ministry who confessed to more than he had already done, eliminating any chance that he would ever go free again, that he would ever breathe the air of freedom so that someone else who was doing time for his crime wouldn't have to be imprisoned another day longer. If God could love and use him, then God can love and use you. God loves you no matter what. And he has a plan and a purpose for you that just might exceed your wildest imagination. <laughs>